Tom here from Orange Systems, and buying a UPS can be a little bit confusing. People have been asking me questions about this, and I said, you know, I'd rather just bring on someone I know that I actually have friends with on LinkedIn and dealt with who knows how to do UPSs. And actually, you do them like at data, data center scale uh, pretty frequently, right, Jordan? Yep, yep. I work with some pretty big monsters, like one megawatt system. So yeah, but he also understands even the ones that we may be putting in our smaller normal racks that don't require megawatts. So we're going to talk about uh, selecting the size of the EPS and just some of the different options and terminology. So we have a source of truth, so to speak, because people will debate about that. And I'm like, well, I don't want to get uh, I don't want to misspeak or say anything wrong. That's why I have Jordan here as a subject matter expert, because this is what he does day in, day out is UPSs. And when we've needed UPSs, we've contacted Jordan. So that's that's what brought this all here. Like, let's just uh, put settle the debate down and talk about specking one out. So and we have some slides here. Don't worry. It's not death by PowerPoint. I, I assure you, it's just we need something to keep us on topic and talking about things and a few illustrations to bring up. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for the introduction, Tom. <laughs> Sorry, I got a straight cat here. <laughs> That's all right. That's all everyone does. If you're in tech, there's a there's a large percentage of tech that cats. has straight cats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so UPS is a UPS. Uh, the smallest to the largest, they all have a lot of the same internals and a lot of the same components. So I think uh, we can address some of the smaller systems, and a lot of that's applicable to the bigger stuff too. Oh, yeah. But, uh, yeah. I really appreciate it's not that. as much the scale. It's about determining what's right for you and what size you need on there. And that's kind of what we're going to be focusing on. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So I think uh, we can go ahead and get started on the next slide whenever okay. you're ready. So this one's pretty obvious. Uh, the biggest reason to use a UPS is to avoid damage to your equipment uh, and to keep your stuff online for a long time. Any downtime can cost a a ton of money. I've seen instances where even 30 minutes of downtime can cost millions of dollars in terms of data loss, in terms of loss processing power. So, you know, you'd be more familiar with, with what downtime can cause. Oh, yeah, yeah. And nobody wants to deal with it. And, you know, it takes a while to reboot and bring everything back up. And especially if you have database applications, unexpected failures are well, not pleasant to deal with is you have more checks that sometimes need to be done to install sure that there's proper integrity on there and allow for safe shutdowns to avoid data loss. That is a topic we're not going to dive deeply into. That's the requirement. And I will leave a link to, cause he's done such a good job. My friend techno Tim has a whole video where he talks about all the methodologies of pulling data out of UPSs. Um, we're focusing on the UPS itself, but that video will be linked down below. Yeah. And I, I got to check that video out too. It's great. Uh, and it's also about the other side of this because it's what people want to know is how do I get my UPS can like, all, and there's so many different ways. And he covers a variety of the different data feeds from a variety of different UPSs that we, it's just, it's a, like an hour long video. It's, but uh, Tim went, went deep on this one to <laughs> bring it to you. It's an entirely different video and it's an entirely uh, related, but uh, important topic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally agree. Uh, so let's go over some of the most common types of, of uh, utility failure uh, that you're going to see. So blackout is the one that's most famous. That's when you lose your yep. input power and stuff shuts down. But we also have a few others. There's 10 common power issues that you're going to see. So you got blackout, which is where you lose power. Uh, power sag, which is where your, your voltage drops below a, a sufficient voltage for your equipment. So let's say you've got 120 volts out of your outlet. It might drop down to 103 volts, and sometimes some equipment can get upset over that. In this instance, power sag is just going to be a short-term term thing, and then a brownout is kind of an extended power sag. Uh, voltage surges, that would be where your, your input voltage goes way too high. Uh, most UPSs, actually almost all UPSs, have something called a metal oxide varistor uh, built into it somewhere. And what that does is it's a, a resistor that increases in resistance exponentially as soon as a, a high voltage comes through. So that's how most UPSs are going to deal with voltage surges. Uh, overvolt would be a continuation of too high of a voltage. So a, a surge might be, you know, a thousand volts or, or a very high input voltage. And an overvoltage would be, let's say you have 140 volts and you're supposed to have 120 volts and in this instance we'll say that that's a continued a continued thing and that that, that can be common in, in industrial environments in places where you got some more noise on, on your line and so can a lot of these other other ones that are coming up so normal mode noise uh, that is 
uh, noise between your line and neutral. So it could be uh, just any sort of EMI uh, noise that you'd see just from uh, equipment that just creates its own noise. Fluorescent lights can create their own noise. All sorts of stuff can create their own noise. Uh, frequency variation, not a super common one, but uh, typically in the US, we're gonna have 60 Hertz, regardless of whether it's 120 volts or 240 volts or 208 volts. 60 Hertz is the typical uh, nominal frequency that you're gonna see on your AC line. Uh, switching transients, those are either spikes or drops in power uh, when some big equipment comes on and it might might cause some, some issues on the line that look like a surge or a drop in power. And then you got harmonic distortion, which is where you've got some more EMI on the line and common mode noise. So those are the 10 most common. Common mode noise is, is noise between your neutral and your ground. The only way to get around that is to bond your neutral and ground on the output of an isolation transformer. So these are kind of complicated, but we see a lot of these in the industrial, especially because um, the starting and stopping of the machines is you'll see the voltage sags. You'll see the you, you can notice it in the lights. That's where you go. Hey, look, the lights are flickering. You know, oh, they're starting the press again. And once it starts up, you know, our industrial clients, that's like if they don't have UPSs, it, the power sags and the brownouts, people don't realize the way they make modern switching power supplies, they compensate for voltage. But if the voltage goes too low and they spend too much time compensating they can get hot and damage let the ups handle it <laughs> yeah yeah exactly uh yeah and you can cause damage like you said a lot of switch mode power supplies are pretty resilient but yeah you still want to have a ups on there they have really pretty beefy capacitors in them that can carry over for really short instances where you might have a dropout like a few milliseconds maybe 30, 40 milliseconds. I, I don't have the exact Yeah, fit. enough to flick that switch yeah. uh, when you're doing the switching modes on, well, I think we'll talk about that towards the end at some point. The yeah. the box you can bypass the UPS. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. All right. uh, so a big part of choosing a UPS is determining what size of UPS you, you need. And it's pretty confusing because a lot of UPS manufacturers might only publish the VA and uh, or they might have... You know this and you might say oh well i've got a 1500 watt power supply so i must need a 1500 watt ups which might not necessarily be the case the most common way to size a ups that i see for smaller ups's is just by nameplate rating it's typically the least accurate uh, the reason being is when you use a nameplate uh, you're not actually determining your true load so even though you might have a nameplate or a a power supply that's capable of delivering 1500 watts, if you're only using 600 watts continuously, you really don't need a, a 1500 watt UPS. There's more accurate ways to, to size a UPS. You do want some overhead in some cases, let's say you can hit that 1500 watt load, then you might want to go with a 1500 watt UPS. Uh, so the most accurate way to measure your actual power draw is by using a like a power measurement device like a kilowatt or an ammeter or something where you're actually looking and seeing how much current you're drawing uh and, and that's that's typically the way i would recommend sizing the ups is actual load and not just your nameplate rating yeah and so. make sure when you test it you have to test it under like whatever the full load is for you uh or even max it out and the reason why is let's say I have a Dell and I, and I do have one, I have one that has the 1500 watt high end power supplies, but the processors and everything in there. And the fact that it has SSDs, there's nothing in there could possibly at its fullest potential draw what the power supply has the maximum potential for. That's why, you know, people are saying, well, if I have a 1500 watt in my head, it makes sense. But if you go, unless you plan on changing out the CPUs, which rarely you do on an enterprise system, usually you put them in for a life cycle time before you pull them out. But you're not going to hit that wattage load on there. You know, you can even run a synthetic benchmark on there to simulate yeah. load. So you can see as high as it'll get, but that's usually as high as it'll get. It may not max out and you really don't want it maxing out the power supplies. I usually, when I'm ordering some of my Dell servers, I'll go with the higher end power supply. So it's being stressed less. So it has a, you know, usually redundant. So uh, yeah, power on there. But like you said, it's not exactly what is representative of the load from actual working. And you can do things like just uh, run the Linux stress in a CPU, pin the CPU and see where it goes. Yeah, if yeah. you don't have high wattage processors and error or components, you'll never hit that high mark there. <laughs> yeah, And in the same vein, if, if you are taxing that power supply to its fullest, 
that 1500 watt rating is the output of the power supply too. Right. So the there's, input, a, there's yeah. a higher on the input. Yeah, exactly. So you might be, they're very efficient. So you might have five or 4% on the input above what that, that that rating is it's very rare i see that honestly like yeah. you're saying 99 percent of the time the power supply is oversized for the equipment to yep. reduce stress on it you know to make sure that it operates extremely reliably uh, and a lot of these ups's can handle peak loads that are higher than the rating uh, especially some of the higher end double conversion or line interactive systems so you know, I think you're exactly right. You stress test it, you look at your normal use, and then you can kind of use that to determine the correct UPS size. Right. Uh, and then another thing is like uh, uh, PoE switches. You might have X PoE power available, but if each of your PoE devices is only using a few watts, which a lot of them only use a few watts, and then the PoE port might be rated to put out, I don't know, what's what's a, a PoE watt? Well, yeah. yeah, yeah. If you have a hundred watt power budget, but you're never going to run more, if you understand your environment really well and you're planning for it, um, because sometimes we put in UPS switches and it may have a hundred watt budget, but it's only ever going to run 10 phones and there's not, there's never a, the building isn't going to grow. So the building's never going to hold more than 10 phones. I, I'm never going to use the full POE budget of that particular supply. So yeah. once again, your rating doesn't have to be, what is the maximum budget of my POE supply? And I make sure I calculate that into the formula for my UPS. It's what we'll actually be running on here. And we're saying all this, I mean, don't get me wrong, Jordan. It's great when people buy the biggest UPS possible. Yeah. <laughs> it's just also, if you want to be more friendly to your budget, you plan it properly rather than bump up and, you know, buy the max. I mean, great. If you have unlimited budget, just, Buy, buy the fancy one. Oh yeah. If <laughs> but, you're that kind of guy, come to me. I'll help I, you. <laughs> I, live in, I don't live in the world with unlimited budgets. <laughs> it's a cool world if you do live there though. <laughs> yeah, I wish. Maybe one day, but <laughs> for now, no. Yeah. Uh, and then we can touch on load type too. And this kind of goes hand in hand with the VA versus watts. So typically you're going to see VA as the listed capacity for a UPS. VA stands for volt amps. And that's an indicator of your apparent power output. So true power is, is your volts, your amps, and then your power factor is also added into there. So uh, inductive loads typically have a higher volt amp uh, rating than their watt rating, at least for a, a short time. So like motor loads, when you're charging up those inductive coils, you're going to see a high current that's out of phase with your voltage. So when your voltage and your amps are out of phase, you're typically going to have a, a lower power factor. Uh, uh, for computer loads, this is really not an issue. So when you're sizing a UPS for a computer load, 90% of computer loads have power factor correction built into them. Uh, so what you want to look for is the watt rating. The VA rating is kind of marketing fluff for most computer loads. So if you're sizing a UPS, you definitely want to look at the watt capacity of the UPS. And you can typically ignore the VA capacity of the UPS because VA is always higher than watts in a UPS. Floor yeah. standing or rack mounted. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it seems kind of obvious, but there's both choices available for most UPS systems. Rack mounted units can be a little more expensive because you have a fixed enclosure that you have to work around. Whereas with the floor mount style UPS, you kind of have more space that you can build your UPS in a, in a layout that makes more sense physically for the UPS. Uh, but now rack mount UPSs are so common and with scales of economy, they're, they're pretty close in terms of price. Uh, yeah. 20 years ago, that's what we had was the big giant floor mounted models in our server room. That was just how we did it then. But that was, yeah. we put that in in the 90s. So yeah. <laughs> different world then. <laughs> You'd be surprised how many UPSs I still see from the 90s. I've seen some UPSs from the 80s even. Yeah. And, well, uh, we yeah. had building integration. We had the colored plugs and certain plugs were on the UPS and other plugs okay. were not. That way people didn't plug like a random vacuum cleaner or floor heater into our uh, power system. So we had them all separate and labeled. So yeah, I'm positive. Like I'm willing to bet that building is because it's not belonged to the company anymore. They sold it. It's still there. It's probably still plugged in. Like, Hey, this thing works. Just keep swapping <laughs> batteries in it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you know, every UPS has its lifespan. Yeah. Uh, that those older units, they used a different, different type of rectifier. They used a pulse based rectifier typically. Uh, and they're, they're pretty dang reliable, but those capacitors start to go out and oh, yeah. having a UPS that's old and sitting there and it actually, it can cause more harm than this, than it's helping. Uh, 
thinking or- actually introduced some of those first page two slide problems yes. of voltage sags and things like that, because as the capacitors um, and, you know, this was famous for motherboards for a little while, you'd see them kind of swell up and you're like, they, once the capacitors are swelling, that means they're going to not per- do their job properly. And therefore the voltage may not be proper. The sags may come into voltage so that you can have clean power coming in and bad power coming out with that. So at some point there is a life cycle at which it's time to replace those. Yeah. And even, even past that, you can kind of have a fire hazard because you got to remember too. a lot of power is going through those UPSs. And as those capacitors age, they increase in resistance, they get more hot. So you can produce heat and that heat can translate potentially to a fire hazard. It's pretty rare. They've got a few safety features built into them. Obviously they've got fusing and stuff that keeps the UPS from exceeding its rated power capacity. But you know, it's at some point, typically 10 years is where UPS, those capacitors have kind of hit their complete lifespan. You can replace them, but at that point, usually for a smaller grade UPS, replacing the whole system makes more sense than tinkering. If you're a tinkerer like I am, sometimes it's fun to do stuff like that. Yeah. You got to remember you're working around very, very high capacity capacitors. And uh, there is some some danger in that of getting shocked or or yeah. sparked. <laughs> well, it depends on your electronics acumen. Take uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So make sure you're careful with any of that. Uh, and the next thing. Next big type of UPS that you can choose from would be lead acid and lithium. Lead acid is kind of the more traditional style of UPS. Lead acid batteries, I think a lot of people have a sour taste in their mouth because uh, there's some really cheap lead acid batteries that cause issues. A lot of commodity commodity grade UPSs that you might find at like Costco or a Walmart, they actually their chargers are, are built to kind of overcharge those lead acid batteries. And on top of that, they use very cheap lead acid batteries. So some of those systems, you might only get one year of, of use out of the battery, two years of use. Whereas lithium, most lithium products, uh, especially UPSs, if you want a UL rated UPS, which I highly recommend with the lithium system, that lithium UPS will have a redundant battery management system. And that battery management system makes sure each cell is charged to the appropriate voltage. Nothing's being overvolted. Uh, and it will balance the cell ch- charge between all those cells in the system. Uh, and it's a longer life cycle on those. The lithium yeah. batteries, What? Is, how long do they last? About eight years? Yeah, eight to ten. I'd say ten is what a lot of manufacturers are claiming. It's, it's actually kind of hard to pin down an exact lifespan on the lithium product. They've been around long enough now that we have a pretty good idea. And ten years seems to be a, a pretty solid indication to us of their lifespan. And we can go over some of the chemistries in the next slide, but these are some of the benefits of lithium over lead and the disadvantages, uh, obviously the longer lifespan. Another big one is the wider temperature operation. Uh, a lead acid battery is gonna perform its very best at 75 degrees Fahrenheit typically. Uh, that's when it's gonna last its fully rated lifespan. Usually UPS batteries are rated three to five years, but there are batteries that are rated up to 10 years. Uh, if you go outside of that 10 degree window, you know, below 65 degrees Fahrenheit or above 85 degrees, you're going to see serious degradation in the lifespan of the battery, uh, maybe half of its rated lifespan just by going outside that operation window. Whereas lithium, you can actually go out to like 104 degrees before you see any significant change in the lifespan of the battery. So for environments where you don't have the best temperature, you know, stability and you don't have climate control, lithium makes a lot more sense. Uh, You also have a higher cycle life. So a lead acid battery can be discharged and recharged about 200 times typically. Uh, A lithium battery, you can go, I think, up to like 10,000 discharges and recharges. The the cycle is a lot more on lithium. And uh, not everyone realizes that. They just assume the old chemistry of lead acid batteries. I'm like, but, you know, anyone who's uh, known what happens the couple times you leave the lights on in your car and you kill a battery, (laughs) they just don't even charge back up to the same amount when they do it. Uh, it lead's got a very different characteristics and and the temperature thing is something to really consider, especially if you're putting these in your, your telco equipment or some of the, um, intermediaries places that you may have this, like where you're running a couple switches and a couple other things, uh, in remote locations. And we run into this a lot. You don't want to, you have to, you can't put temperature controllers, but all I can say is like, it's a little building usually somewhere. They got a couple fans in there. It's subjected to the weather outside more than anything else so yeah. and lithium gives you a little bit more flexibility on that 
Yeah. And then on top of that, you don't have to send somebody out to the, the remote site to replace the batteries, which a lot of times costs more than even just investing in lithium to begin with. Yeah. The new ones we've went all with are, are lithiums. That's what we went with. So Yeah. And I think it makes the most sense, especially for the rack style UPSs where you're going out, you're putting in, you know, a bunch of uh, uh, access points at a site. You don't want to have to go back out to that customer site every three years and mess with the UPS. You want to set it and forget it. You know, so, um, A concern a lot of people have brought up whenever I've mentioned I have some lithium UPSs is what about, you know, aren't these things a giant waiting to explode uh, problem? And not really, not they, they're, there's a lot more safety around them. And if you've ever seen what happens when you short out a lead acid battery and it goes crazy, I mean, yeah. no matter which chemistry you go with, you're storing a lot of potential energy. You may not see it, but you can picture it just like how you wind up a rubber band. When you charge these, you store a high volume of potential energy densely in a small area. If you yeah. try to release that energy too fast with a short, whether it's lead acid or lithium, you have a problem <laughs> at some yeah. level. You got to remember UPS batteries are pretty huge so for lithium there is some some extra safety that you really have to take into consideration and that's why I, i'm a big proponent of using lithium iron phosphate batteries in a ups it's the most stable chemistry of battery out there in terms of lithium uh, those are the ones that you can puncture and you have the lower risk of fire uh, I'll, you're right every ups system that's ul rated specifically has to have some fire propagation safety measures whether it's redundant battery management systems or or something even more sophisticated for the really big systems uh, but that's why i all you you should look out for lithium iron phosphate they last a long time they're very safe uh, but you also really really want to make sure that your ups is ul rated uh, that's just an extra set of safety precautions and certifications that it has to go through I think in Europe it's CE. Uh, yeah. yeah, and they're also for for people that don't know, and I'll do a breakdown um, of one of them soon. That they're kind of they're they're metal contained. Like the battery itself is not exposed. You're not likely to even if you shorted it. The battery management system, um, and this is goes for a lot of devices are designed this way. The cells will start breaking apart with fuses inside them. So yeah. shorts just don't. They're rare to get a thermal runaway in a UPS in general, um, and more so because it, when you look at the way LiPo is designed, it's a whole series of small cells put together. That's why you need a BMS system versus lead acid is one group of plates dipped in acid. So there's not a bunch of separate plates you're charging uh, individually. It's one large battery. So the thing you get the advantage of. I mean, phones are easy to, because they're small and it's easy to puncture them. They don't have metal armor. We're trying to make these things as thin as possible. These are armored in there. So physical damage, very unlikely. Uh, short outs, generally, they just pop the fuses and that's the end of that battery's life, but it didn't that's cause true. any distress for you. It's just the aggravation of replacing it. <laughs> yeah. And you're right. Actually, lead acid has its own set of, of safety issues that you can take into consideration, especially for me. I see when I go to a lot of these data centers, they have something called wet cell batteries, uh, which are kind of, you know, on a motorcycle battery, you have to fill it up with water. Yeah. It's essentially similar to that, but they're, they're really big. I mean, these things are three, oh, four yeah. pounds each, and they might have 30 or 40 of them. And those batteries, uh, you can evaporate the electrolyte, then you increase your resistance, and that can cause something called thermal runaway. So you can get thermal runaway with... Uh, a, a lead style battery. I've seen it. If you look recently in the news, there was a data center in France that I think it was in France. That yeah. down, yep. And that was actually due to, to poor maintenance uh, on their, on their uh, uh, battery management. Style. Style. Yeah. yeah. The OVH, OVH fire. If you look that up, that was about a year ago, I think. Yeah. And you'd be surprised. A lot of these data centers are neglecting their batteries or they just don't have the the knowledge on what to look out for. If you see heat in a battery, it's a really bad sign. If the battery is, is you know, batteries get a little bit warm under use, but the battery should never be, you know, uncomfortably warm to the touch or swelling. If those two indicators mean that that battery is dangerous, uh, it's it's either time dead. Time to take it out of service. Time to take it out of service. <laughs> <laughs> Leaving something like that can just cause bigger issues. Uh, yep. And then the, there's some common models uh, for, for, for lithium units. Usually they're going to have an LI or, or an L somewhere in there. Uh, so some extreme models are the J60V80LI, P91LI, and the J90. Uh, then I put the chemistries for all the ones I could figure out. 
Eaton has a 9PX LI and the 5P, uh, and then APC has the SMTL and SCL. Some of these UPSs, you have to be careful. They don't ship to certain states. I don't know what why the reasoning is behind that, if they need some extra requirements. Yeah, there's there's a few new requirements that they're putting on for shipping anything lithium. The Some of the states just made some laws. I think they're trying to sort it all out. <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, I think there's a certification. UN 38.3 is a safe transport certification. So you can look out for that as a, a rating that the UPS might be able to go in those states. I'm not sure you'd have to look up your each, each state yeah. law. And, and that's changing, so I don't want to date the video because check your state's <laughs> laws. And actually, if you're buying it, you know, you'll know you find out that it can't be shipped in certain states because even there's yeah. warnings now with some of the UPSs. But hopefully you live in a future watching this where this has all been resolved. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so let's go over standby UPS. Uh, it's the most basic type of UPS. This is the type of UPS you probably go to Office Depot and you can just pick up off the shelf. They're, they're usually pretty small, pretty inexpensive. But they have a, a place. I mean, for a lot of equipment, you don't really need the biggest, beefiest UPS. And there are some good, well-made standby UPSs out there. These are the most commodity grade, I'd say. They're the most disposable. Uh, advantages are that they're smaller, lighter, less expensive. Uh, but they don't protect you from all the different power issues you can run into. Extended, extended surges, uh, uh, brownouts, that sort of stuff. And we can go over the different power issues yeah. that the GPSs protect them. But for, yeah. for a home PC, the, yeah. you know, just so you have something on there so you can look around you and realize the power went out and go, oh, I should probably power it on my computer. <laughs> so yeah. they're, they're perfectly fine for that use case. Um, yeah. it, it, the simplicity of it is good. Yeah. And the biggest one that's going to damage your home equipment is going to be surges, obviously, uh, which is, you know, from electrical it, storms, yeah. uh, stuff like that. So surges are typically what's going to blow up your equipment. Uh, and this is going to protect you from that. So it's the, you know, the, the bare minimum type of UPS that you can have, that's still considered a UPS. Yeah. So standby UPS is, is essentially just going to be passing your utility input onto your load uh, under normal operating condition. Uh, and then as soon as there's a power outage, it's got a little relay uh, that got covered by my arrow there. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. And, and roughly four to, to I've seen some online publishers say 30 milliseconds, but it's rare you see UPS that's 30 milliseconds. It's usually four to eight milliseconds after the power's gone out. That relay is going to switch. It's going to go over to inverter, and you're going to pass your, your your power on from your UPS inverter. Line Interactive is a step up from a standby UPS. It adds something called an AVR, an automatic voltage regulator. And it's a tiny little automatic switching transformer. And what that's going to do is adjust your input voltage uh, coming into your UPS. It's got different increments. So if it sees in, incoming power is 5% too high or voltage is 5% too high, it'll switch it down. So on your output, you get 5% lower voltage. Uh, so if you're supposed to get 120 volts and you got 140 on your input, it'll buck, buck that voltage down to 120. Uh, these are also low cost. They typically have more features than standby UPSs. So you might be able to get SNMP so you can or web interface or USB output so you can communicate with the UPS. And they're, they're great UPS for a lot of a lot of applications, honestly. Uh, some lighter duty servers, uh, network switches, again, a home PC. Uh, and, and here's some common models you'll see. Uh, you can look up any of those models. Yeah, each, each UPS manufacturer has their indicator of what type of UPS. So Eaton 5 as a prefix means that it's a, a, a line interactive UPS. And then APC SM, Extreme 80 or 70 series are both line interactive. Uh, and the 80 series is kind of the more premium option out of those two. So really pretty similar. The only difference is you've got an AVR, or automatic voltage regulator, which we talked about earlier. So yeah. that's going to help you adjust your input voltage so that your load has a more, uh, a more consistent voltage. Uh, it's also going to use that same relay style. Uh, of switch, so you got that same transition time. Usually, that's not going to matter to most switch mode power supply equipment. So, computer loads don't typically care about that. Motor loads can because now you've stopped your motor potentially, and now you have to restart it. Usually, it's not fast enough uh, to, to matter. But some equipment can can get bothered by that switch over time. Uh, so. I would probably say Line Interact is a good one for a lot of home users and things like yeah. that. If you want something a little bit better, 
but you know, maybe you run in the home lab and you go, I'd like something a little bit nicer for some of these servers I have and yeah. line interactive. Cause it's got that AVR and it is, it, it meets the price point is not too expensive, Correct. you know, without going into the next level ones. Now online UPS, this is where we get a few more things going. Yeah. So this is, this is really the data center grade UPS that you're going to see. It's going to protect you from a lot of different issues. Uh, the, the way an online UPS works, it's, it's always going to be taking that input power. It's going to be converting it into DC and then reinverting it into AC. So the input voltage that you're putting into the UPS never actually touches your equipment on the output because it's being switched from AC to DC, which eliminates a lot of that noise and that, or almost all of that noise and then reinvert it into AC. These are super robust. And this is really what I'd recommend uh, for, for some more critical equipment. Uh, the inverter circuitry, the rectifier circuitry is usually beefier than a, a line interactive because it's got to work all the time. Uh, so they give you great protection. You can you can get a lot more noise reduction. You can protect yourself from a lot of different issues that you're going to see coming through the power line. And you can actually turn an online UPS into a line interactive UPS if you want to get that higher efficiency. Usually they have a function called eco mode. You can turn that on. So you actually have the option to turn an online UPS into a line interactive UPS if you needed to. These are gonna be more expensive than your line interactive systems, but they do offer some some great benefits. You know, Yeah, the robust. constant conversion makes them, because you're always getting a perfect power coming out because it's figuring it out. Whatever's coming in doesn't matter. We're gonna convert it to DC. Exactly. And we're gonna convert it ourselves and there is a loss though. Uh, what yeah. is the loss rate on these roughly? So it depends on the manufacturer. It used to be a lot worse. I mean, these things used to be about 85, 90% at the, the high end. Uh, now you can see these, these types of UPS is at, at 95% efficiency. So that's, you're only losing about 5% of your, your, your power budget by converting from AC to DC and back to AC. So, I mean, just the efficiency of, of modern transistors has made these, really pretty dang efficient and so to me that the concern about that efficiency is is it's not as important as it used to be um, back in the old days when you when you're losing 10 percent of your power to the ups you're generating a lot of heat that that you know wasn't as nice but now they're so efficient that uh, i think efficiency is kind of a moot point uh, it's usually the higher price is going to be the the biggest uh, concern for a lot of people with this type of ups yeah we used to have one of these on uh, commercial phone systems and things like that. But that was always the thing is like, wow, these things, they, you would notice the inefficiency by the fact that if there's heat, that's yes. a sign of inefficiency. That's, that's how electronics work. If it's generating yeah. heat, it's doing something inefficient. <laughs> uh, another benefit I didn't touch on. Uh, so a line interactive UPS, if it stops working, you don't really know until you have a power outage. Uh, True because the UPS is pass, passing through its input. I mean, you're supposed to get a fault, but if that doesn't happen, you don't really know. A double conversion UPS, if it has a fault, it'll switch over to STS bypass mode and it'll alarm at you and say, hey, there's something wrong with my internals and you need to address it. So if there is a power outage, you will at least have that alert beforehand and potentially yeah. with the line interactive system, you might not, not have that notice. You, you find out, well, in, yes, we, we did some troubleshooting recently where we found out it was a line interactive that had gone bad because they couldn't figure out one, one whole leg of the network was out and they had oh, several yeah. MDFs. It turns out the line interactive one after a small surge, then no one was monitoring it, no SNMP hooked up. So it, maybe oh. it was screaming. I don't know. It just, we found it beeping in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> we, we diagnosed it by listening. What's that beeping noise? Oh, that's the thing that they can't come on for some reason. That's why the whole section of the network's down. <laughs> yeah. And but then, to find out ahead of time, that's cool that alarm, because what it's doing is, you know, instead of doing its job as an online UPS, a double, the double conversion type thing, it's just, it, by, it has a bypass circuit in there. So it just goes yeah. straight, which is cool because it's better than a down situation. And that a knowing ahead of time can definitely save you like, hey, it's got an alarm on it. Let's address the alarm on a maintenance window. Not, not when one is thrown upon us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Get ahead of the situation before you you lose your power and then you don't get some angry customer. Hey, what's going on? Why, why is everything going out? So yeah. good models on these. It looks like they're the higher models. So like you yep. calls them the nine series. So that's how, you know, an eight and one is a nine, the, the whole nine line. The same looks like extreme, same thing. It's got the yep. nine in it. It's all the onlines. 
Yep, yep. And a lot of these manufacturers make it very confusing what's line interactive and what's a double conversion. So you really have to kind of dig through a lot of these and make sure it's a true double conversion because uh, I think it's I think some of the Lieberts have some some verbiage into the line interactives that, you know, you're like, is this a double conversion? And then you look at it and it's actually just a line interactive UPS. So make sure that it's actually a true double conversion well, online UPS if you're looking for that that style of UPS. What you're doing is you're taking that input power, you're passing it through a filter, and that filters for the UPS really. Uh, then it's going to be uh, uh, rectified into DC. It's going to be inverted into AC. It's going to go through a static switch. That's your bypass for the UPS. It's not the maintenance bypass, but it's the first bypass internal to the UPS. Then it's going to go through some filtering and out to your load. In the case of a power outage, there's zero switch over time because that inverter is always running. So if there's a power outage, it to your your load there it doesn't even notice i mean it's there's zero switch over time and that that sine wave is almost always on on an online ups going to be sinusoidal it's going to be very very pretty and, and perfectly signed isolated online yeah. this is the there's a narrower fewer <laughs> of these options yeah. Medical equipment <laughs> yep so medical equipment i mean these are these are pretty common too not so much in the data center uh, they are still prevalent in the data center Reason being is you uh, isolated online UPS, what it has on the output is a, a isolation transformer. Uh, so for an isolated online UPS, you can feed it 208 and then the isolation transformer on the output, the UPS is gonna output 240 volts typically and the isolation transformer on the output is gonna divide that into two 120 volt legs and a 240 volt leg. So if you need 120 volts for some reason, you can use this style of UPS to get uh, a neutral on your output if you only have, uh, uh, you know, like an L630 available instead of an L1430. So this gives you the extra option of, of getting 120 volts on your output. It okay. also cleans up common mode noise, which you see, I see that a lot in like from fluorescent lights, uh, it's, and, and just equipment in general, lab equipment, motors, uh, equipment that puts noise in that 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 neutral line because neutral should have roughly zero volts to ground in an ideal condition your neutral is not going to have much voltage to ground but that's rarely the case because the only spot you bond neutral in an electrical system is typically the main panel and the only way you can bond neutral to ground after that is by using an isolation transformer which this ups typically has or will have integrated into it uh, so yeah, you see these in, in medical equipment, uh, area, areas where they got medical equipment, uh, laboratories, I see them a ton. Uh, uh, that's the biggest market for these uh, that I've seen is for laboratories uh, where they've got HPLCs, you know, gas chromatography machines, all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, X-ray chromatography machine I put a UPS on too. So. Yep. I was, I'm talking to a guy, they, they actually take, uh, so they design semiconductors and we were talking about how extensive it is to build the new lab they're building um, because they need all this type of equipment because, you know, they're, it's tiny, tiny photography looking at the wafers and making sure there's no variations. You can't have any, you know, common mode noise on the line or you will have a problem where you could project variation into the semiconductor stuff they're building. I mean, their fabrication place is like, it was like a $200 million building they built to do this place. It's just crazy. <laughs> but they're yeah. a fabricator here in Michigan uh, doing it. So I didn't, we didn't get into the, uh, this talk. We're talking most about their four petabytes of storage they need. That's how big all the data storage needs are for them. That's, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> but, wow. but yeah, the actual, um, the, the photography part of it, essentially of how they actually look and uh, design stuff yes it's extremely sensitive equipment exactly. that they need to build isolation rooms for to understand it and it's not just isolation from outside influence but really power isolation and outside potential interferences from things like that so yeah this is your this is like you said your lab equipment stuff <laughs> yeah yeah the ultra sensitive uh but you do see it in data centers too yeah typically a data center is going to use a, a big 480 volt ups Reason being is when you use a higher voltage in your UPS, you can use thinner conductors and you have less loss to heat. So you can make a, a, a higher capacity UPS in the same footprint that you might have a lower capacity UPS at a lower voltage. So a higher voltage for most UPSs means you get a smaller size UPS for the equivalent watt rating. 
So if you're choosing a UPS, I always recommend going with the highest voltage you have available because you can minimize the footprint of the UPS. Now, in some cases, you might want to use a 208 volt UPS instead of a 480 volt UPS, but you're probably going to be talking to somebody if you're looking for that size of UPS where it's, it's uh, you know. Yeah, we, we've installed the, you know, two, 208 ones. Um, we don't see as many, uh, we don't at least, of the yeah. 480s. Those are, we don't do a ton of work inside of data centers, but yeah, and, and not all buildings until you get into the bigger buildings have a 480 service. So uh, yeah. our industrial clients do, of course, but uh, to run all those presses and things like that, but it's not, not your average office building. <laughs> no, yeah. yeah, 480 is usually, uh, 480 volt UPS, the, the minimum size you're typically going to see is going to be maybe 120 kilowatts. So that's uh, so the isolated online. It it looks like identical to the, the the regular online, except you've got that isolation transformer, the MBA MBS indicator on there. That's maintenance bypass. Uh, so that's a bypass that switches your utility out to your load and completely bypasses the internal to the UPS. That's not exclusive to an isolated online UPS. You can have those in a traditional online UPS. Uh, even a standby UPS, if you yeah. want. This is just what allows for maintenance of the UPS, being able to have exactly. a manual bypass. Yep, exactly. So let's see. So maintenance bypass is around the topic of bypasses. Yes. Uh, these are really handy devices. Uh, you know, they, they allow you to bypass your UPS, uh, to service it, to remove it, to replace it. It's essentially a switch. Uh, you can find them rack mounted uh, in one U or zero U in some cases. They sit behind the UPS, uh, and there's two types of bypass. There's a break before make. These are the simplest. They have a break over time from when they transfer from UPS to utility. It's typically roughly six milliseconds, like the U standby UPS. And the reason they have that break over time is a UPS's output is sometimes not in phase with the input from the utility. And a double conversion, it's very rarely going to be in phase unless you tell it to be. Right. If you have those two out of phase, when you bridge that, you can cause all sorts of issues. You can back feed, you can cause sparks. You have to make sure your output phasing is in phase with your utility if you're going to bypass it. And so if you use a make before break, the fancier style of bypass without a switching time, it needs to be able to communicate with the UPS and say, hey, you need to get in line with the utility. The UPS is going to transfer over to static bypass. That's what STS stands for. And then you can safely switch over because you're 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 keeping your output in phase with your utility. And um, just to be clear, break before make is probably the least expensive and easiest one you'll get. And they're they're just slick little yeah. devices that when you're building your rack, when you're putting it in, or you put this little box in there, and you're like, oh, I need to service the UPS, but I don't want to. Who wants downtime? So you just flip the switch, and now you're on your main utility, and you can you know, swap out an entire UPS at this point, essentially. <laughs> yeah. And another nice thing is if you had a complete UPS failure, what you can do is just go over there, click the switch and boom. Yep. Now you're you have running. your stuff offline. You're not running around trying to unplug stuff, plug it into PDUs. It just gives you that, that handy function where if, if you have a, a critical piece of gear, you don't have to have any downtime other than if the UPS fails and you can just quickly switch yeah, back. Really right? simple device. Yeah, and really handy. Because if you if you don't have one, you'll wish you had at some point. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think we're even talking about some customers that don't want the, their equipment to go down at all when they're putting the UPS in. And <laughs> having yeah. something like this so. helps. <laughs> yeah. uh, and right. then there's external and internal ones. Uh, internal bypasses you're going to find typically in modular UPSs because the module itself in a modular UPS is actually the UPS. So you can use a, a they're usually going to be a make before break and anything above 5k VA. The smaller stuff is going to be break before make, but the bigger stuff, again, it's going to be the higher end make before break. Typically, the old school bypasses were all external, but now since the UPS enclosure actually doesn't touch the power, you can actually get away with putting these inside the enclosure. Both options still exist and they're both really common. Uh, I sell probably the for the bigger systems, 60% of maybe 60 to 50% have a bypass somewhere in them. Probably 80% of the stuff I work with, I definitely recommend it. And yeah, it's usually going to find these in bigger UPSs. Smaller UPSs are not as common, but they do exist. Uh, Extreme Power actually makes one that be compatible with any type of UPS. You got to eat in UPS uh, for the make or the break before make style. That's going to work with any manufacturer. You don't have to have. Yeah. 
an Eaton brand with a, a Eaton or an APC with an APC. And then it's just called a, a bypass module for the rack style versions. Yeah, it's it's a simple device. Go with that one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> connectivity. Yeah, so uh, connectivity, uh, if you're choosing a UPS, you got to figure out whether it's something that you want. If you want to be able to monitor the power coming into it, if you want to, you know, have an SNMP trap where if the UPS goes down, you have an SMP server, I can send a graceful shutdown command. That's the way that I've seen it done typically. If you're, you're, and they can tell it when it's, you know, on the UPS is critically low. So you don't have to have a graceful shutdown command when the UPS is just turning itself on. You can say, all right, when the, the charge is at a critically low point, shut it, all my equipment down. Um, yeah. And once again, I'll reference Techno Tim's video linked in the comments yeah, below. Yeah. And he tells you, he explains the different uh, Linux servers and even building. I think he's got a Raspberry Pi in there somewhere that can do the monitoring of it because you want to centralize that data and then send out the commands to things, but you need to exactly. first have a UPS with to feed that data and then spread it out because it's usually not one server you're turning off, especially if you've got several racks, it's, it's numerous servers or services that need to be shut down before you shut down the physical server. Uh, there's yeah. an order and a cadence to those things, but it all starts with making sure what types of connectivity that the UPS is offer. Yeah. And uh, I, Typically stay away from trying to use the USB because it, it requires either, a lot of them require proprietary drivers. Yes. So if you have the web interface, it really makes it easier because you're not relying on some UPS manufacturer's driver connectivity. Yes. You can do everything just, just from the web card. Never allow your UPS to communicate with the outside world, in my oh. opinion. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> oh. You see, it, all the big manufacturers want people to have them remote monitor their UPS. And it's just a huge safety concern to me. And I'm sure you agree with that, Tom. Yeah, and um, I think APC had a vulnerability related to that where they found some yeah. vulnerabilities in it. And the, the workaround is don't connect it online. That's like the yeah. workaround for this. And I don't understand, they just didn't implement it in a good way. And someone figured out a way to uh, basically flick your UPS on and off multiple times, possibly damaging equipment, certainly causing chaos. So you don't. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the only the only thing I can think of that you'd need external communication for would be like a time server. But I think you can get that on your local network easier. Yeah, than else. yeah that's, <laughs> that's common. You know, you can yeah. run uh, PF sense. I set these up frequently with uh, time because, you know, a lot of times people have IOT devices, usually cameras, and you want the time to be in sync, but you don't want to give them internet access. And that's exactly. you. you can yeah. run a time server pretty simply on your network and specify it in your DHCP reservations, throw it in there. It'll grab the time locally without having to go out to the internet and problem solved. That's yeah, <laughs> without, like, without adding security yeah. risk of let's send all our UPS data to a cloud so they can monitor it and have the ability to push data back to it. That just doesn't no, don't oh, do that. I, I agree. See, I was a little bit concerned, but I was like, I, everything's IOT now, but I think, yeah, anything you can have on a, like a VLAN without any communication to the outside yeah. world, the safer you are. And there's not really any reason stuff like cameras or UPS should ever be talking in the outside world. Yeah, it just doesn't need to. It's yeah. and someone flicking a power on and off of that is just it's yeah. gonna be dangerous. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> so here's how you can get a hold of Jordan if you're interested in yep. uh, building some of these. Uh follow him on LinkedIn. This is what got the discussion started because you post a lot of photos of the different things you guys are building and how you're laying them out and everything else. It's just really cool oh, uh yeah. seeing all this. So it's you know, building the megawatt UPS systems uh are oh, pretty yeah. neat. And we've worked some really interesting projects. Uh, uh, you know, like lately, I've been working with a lot of these edge data centers. Are you familiar with edge data centers, Tom? No. So they're like mini data centers that that reduce your your latency. So you could have a, a little enclosure that might be a, a, a six, 60 kVA or something, okay. uh, and it, they they sit closer to where the end user is. Okay. You reduce your latency. So like Netflix might want servers closer to people in some smaller town, but they don't, their data centers way out in, in Texas. So you can have an edge data center where you can offload some of that processing uh, to a much smaller, smaller data center. And then it can kind of handle a lot of that less critical uh, work. And we see it with DNS companies too. They want, you know, even though the latency is so minuscule going to, you know, because you're essentially, but it's right. still, 
yeah, it still matters when you're setting it up and you start thinking about some of these real time protocols and things like that, especially anything in the video streaming or conferencing type of things. Uh, yeah, you, you'll see these intermediary spots where they have extra things put in. So, you know, we see even some clients will stick something in a colo for that intermediary. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that latency is, but yeah, when you compound it too, if you've got to do this process has to wait for that one, then all of a sudden that eight milliseconds can turn into like, you know, half a second yeah. or something. So it, it makes a difference. Uh, and as stuff gets more more advanced and we have more processing power. So we've scaled out and we make the largest single phase UPS. So 60 kilowatts a single phase. Because a lot of these smaller smaller areas, they, they don't have three phase power. You're using essentially what you get at home. So, so I've worked some cool projects where we're, we're using a big, big single phase UPS. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty cool. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll leave links to everything we talked about down below, direct links to your LinkedIn and everything. If you want to contact Jordan on this. So hopefully uh, you know more and now you can reference what type of UPS, understand how they yeah. work and which one is a good fit for you. All right. Thanks for your time, Jordan. Appreciate it. Thank you, Tom. Bye. And thank you for making it all the way to the end of this video. If you've enjoyed the content, please give us a thumbs up. If you would like to see more content from this channel, hit the subscribe button and the bell icon. If you'd like to hire a short project, head over to lawrencesystems.com and click the Hire Us button right at the top. To help this channel out in other ways, there's a join button here for YouTube and a Patreon page where your support is greatly appreciated. For deals, discounts, and offers, check out our affiliate links in the description of all of our videos, including a link to our shirt store where we have a wide variety of shirts that we sell and designs come out, well, randomly, so check back frequently. And finally, our forums. Forums.lawrencesystems.com is where you can have a more in-depth discussion about this video and other tech topics covered on this channel. Thanks again for watching and look forward to hearing from you.